I'm high. It's me, Harry Potter, after he went to wizard college and became a sorcerer's stoner. So when I was around 10 or 11 is when my family first got a subscription to Netflix. And one day, while fifth grade me was browsing the available titles, I stumbled across a show titled HR Puffin Stuff. The cover of which grabbed my attention because, well, look at it. What's going on here? What, what is this guy supposed to be, a clown with like a lizard body? Naturally, I couldn't help my curiosity, so I started watching the show and... I loved it. Not because it stimulated me intellectually or anything, I mean it was intended for very small children, but just look at it. There's nothing else that looks like this aesthetically. Except maybe those old McDonald Land commercials, which actually looked so similar to HR Puff and stuff that the creators sued McDonald's and won. Which is actually part of the reason they stopped using the McDonald Land characters in advertising as much. And humanity has been on the decline ever since. Would 9 11 have gone down the same way if Hamburglar and Mayor McCheese were still blessing our screens with their presence? Who's to say? Speaking of the show's creators, those would be Sid and Marty Croft, Canadian-born puppeteers who broke into television after doing design work on the show The Banana Splits. Soon after, in 1969, they created and produced the children's television series H.R. Puffin Stuff, which told the story of a human boy, Jimmy, and his magic-talking flute, Freddy. The two reside on Living Island, a place where seemingly everything from the trees to the candles are sentient. The mayor of the island is the titular H.R. Puffin Stuff, who is apparently supposed to be a dragon. Him, along with a colorful cast of supporting characters, protect Jimmy from the sinister witchy poo an enchantress who wants to steal Freddy the Flute and use his magic for evil. The series ran for one 17-episode season, followed by a feature-length film adaptation which was released theatrically the following year in 1970. So, due to this show being released in the late 60s, and the title being Puffin Stuff, and everything about the way the show looks... Some have speculated that the whole series, despite supposedly being intended for children, is a giant, not-so-subtle celebration of recreational drugs. There's even a parody of Puffin Stuff from the 90s sketch comedy series Mr. Show with Bob and David that leans into this idea. want to pizza. Oh god, oh god, oh god, these clothes. They're too tight, they're strangling me. I'm having a hard time here, man. But was there ever any truth to that theory? Or is it just one of those countless conspiracy theories about children's media that tries to find some darker adult element where there never was one? Well, in 2004, when asked if the supposed drug references were intentional, creator Marty Croft said the following. We've heard that for 35 years. We did not intentionally do anything related to drugs in the story. People thought we were on drugs. You can't do good television while on drugs. People never believe you when you say that, but you can't. The shows were very bright and spacey looking. They may have lent themselves to that culture at the time, but we didn't ascribe that meaning to them. And I can't speak to what adults were doing when they were watching the shows. We just set out to make a quality children's program. Now I know I should probably just take his word for it on this, but honestly, I don't know if I believe him. Not to sound like a broken record, but look at this show. You're telling me drugs played zero part in crafting this aesthetic? Also, people think the initials HR stand for like hand-rolled marijuana, but apparently they just stand for Highness Royal, which is Royal Highness backwards because he's like the ruler of Living Island. But it's specified that he's the mayor of the island, not the king. Also, even if that were true, I don't know if it helps the argument because Highness, if you feel me. Also, he said that you can't do television while on drugs. Well, tell that to all the shows Seth Rogen has worked on. This right now is the best day of my entire life. So personally, I don't take that quote from Marty Croft as definitive proof that drugs played no part in H.R. Puffin Stuff's development. I think that they did, or at least that the references to them were all intentional and he was just saying that to cover his ass. I was gonna say, I guess we'll never know, but I realize that's a Kanye quote. I guess we'll never know. And I don't really want to be quoting him right now. So I'll just shrug. So I've always loved those multi-hour deep dive videos that a lot of other creators have done on television shows. But I knew that if I ever wanted to try making one, I should start with a shorter series as to not overwhelm myself. 
And in addition to only consisting of 17 episodes and a movie, Puffin Stuff is something there exist very few videos on, despite how interesting I personally find it. So I thought it would be the perfect franchise for me to try a deep dive on. Real quick personal anecdote, I actually started writing this video several months ago, but halfway through re-watching the series, I realized I didn't think I wanted to spend that much time on a single video, so I abandoned the idea. But then recently, whilst dealing with one of the worst creative slumps that I've ever experienced, I go to see the new Indiana Jones movie, which takes place in 1969, the year H.R. Puffin stuff aired. And incredibly minor spoiler for that film, there's a scene where on Indiana Jones TV, H.R. Puffin stuff is playing. Now, I don't know if I believe in signs from the universe, but seeing a reference to an incredibly niche show from the 60s that I had already started writing a video about months ago, during a time where I was struggling creatively, in a movie titled Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, if signs from the universe were real, I'm pretty sure that's what they would look like, so I'm making the video. And if this video does end up somehow changing the course of my life, I honestly might start going to church. Or I'll just rewatch The Chosen, that's basically the same thing. So without further ado, I hope you'll join me as I journey through the curiously trippy world of H.R. Puffin Stuff. Episode 1, The Magic Path. So every episode opens with the theme song, which catches us up on all the necessary lore. Once upon a summertime, just a dream from yesterday, a boy in this magic golden flute heard a boat from on the bay. That is all the backstory that we get in the show for Jimmy and his magic flute, by the way. Just that there's a boy and he has a magic golden flute. And if you can't accept that, this isn't the show for you. The theme song then explains how Jimmy gets on this happy sentient boat, but it turns out to be a trap set by the evil witchy poo to get a hold of his flute. However, on a nearby island, the dragon mayor puff and stuff and the mute firefighters cling and clang get to Jimmy before the witch does. If I were Jimmy and I woke up from nearly drowning to these three standing over me, I'd think that I died and went to hell. Then the rest of the theme song is just the chorus. He's your friend when things get rough. He's your stuff. Can't do so that's all the backstory you get as to why this human boy is living on this island populated entirely by puppets. The first episode then picks up right after the events of the theme song, where after getting acquainted with Puffin Stuff, Jimmy asks why the witch tried to kidnap him. Mr. Puffin Stuff, why did that witch try to capture me? I don't even know her. You must have something she wants, and she can be pretty grabby. This is my pal, Freddy. He's the only talking fruit in the world. Please, Jimmy, squeeze the water out of me. I'll get rusty. <laughs> I told you guys up front this was a weird show. When Jimmy asks how he and Freddy can get away, Puffin Stuff suggests they go see Dr. Blinky. We better go see Dr. Blinky. Dr. Blinky? So one of the unintentionally really funny aspects of this show is Puffin Stuff's mouth. It hangs open when he's not speaking, its movements never match what he's saying, and the lower jaw bounces when he runs. So firefighters Kling and Klang, who look like the lemmings from the puzzle strategy video game, but apparently they're supposed to be sentient bells, take Jimmy and Puff and stuff to go see Dr. Blinky, before we transition to Witchy Poo watching them from her castle with her two henchmen, Orson Vulture and Seymour Spider. <laughs> Just gotta adjust the fine tuning. <laughs> and until you do, don't point it at me! <laughs> Whoa, Witchy Poo, you can't hurt your employees like that. I'm calling HR. Because the show's called HR Puffins. Back with Puffin Stuff and Jimmy, he learns that everything on the island is sentient, as evidenced by a hippie tree. Hey, baby, you're real cool, man, like Groove. Dr. Blinky's house, which like sneezes. Watch you! And all of Dr. Blinky's belongings, which also talk. Good to see ya, Puffy. You're looking very natural. We then finally meet Dr. Blinky, who's an owl mad scientist that sounds like the Disney Mad Hatter. Excuse me, I got something cooking. 
it. Blinky then tells them that someone named Judy the Frog knows a way off the island, but she's currently in Witchy Pooh's dungeon, so they'll have to rescue her. He supplies them with a potion to protect them from the witch's spells and sends them on their way. Back at Witchy Pooh's castle, Orson informs her of their arrival. Keep an eye on the picture. All right, if I can stay up late and watch the scary movie. Okay, and if you're real good, I'll bring you back a roach beef sandwich. <laughs> I like to think the scary movie that Orson wants to stay up and watch is Alfred Hitchcock's The Humans. Witchy Pooh then goes to her third henchman, Stupid Bat. And I don't mean to be so rude, that's just his official name. I am right side up. You're upside down. Oh, never mind you, ding a -ling. She tells him to travel to the forest to watch Puff and Stuff and Jimmy. Now go! I'm off! Da -da 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 -da. Also, Witchy Pooh's castle can talk. Castle, castle on the moat. Who's the most beautiful witch afloat? Not you, you all go. She then orders a gang of evil trees to capture Puff and Stuff and Jimmy. Puff and Stuff, look! Hi, strangers. How about the nut? No, thanks. When your girl want a quickie, but it's November, the trees attempt to capture them, but are foiled by Stupid Bat. So Witchy Poo decides to go after them herself on the vehicle she calls the Vroom Broom. She zaps them with a freezing spell and imprisons them in the dungeon, but luckily she didn't get a hold of Freddy because Puff and Stuff hid him in his skin. Yeah, at least she didn't find Freddy, thanks to you, Puff and Stuff. Yeah, thanks, man. Woo, it was hot under there. Gross. Jimmy then sings a song about missing home. And this show does eventually have some good songs, but this isn't one of them. We start the day in clover, but before the day was over, we'd end up in another world far away. They then meet Judy Frog, who suggests they use Freddy to escape the dungeon. Freddy plays higher and higher, and after Judy Frog joins him, Please, let me help! Oh! They're able to shatter the bars and escape. Witchy Poo, who heard the sound from upstairs, goes to check on them. Oh, Sesame! Sesame? The name's Lester! But finds she's too late. Judy brings Puff and Stuff and Jimmy to the magic path that can take him home, but Witchy Poo shows up and destroys the path. Just when she's about to take Freddy, however, Kling and Clang show up to save the day. Why'd you cut back to me? Oh, you expected me to make a joke about Witchy Poo's wand going flaccid, didn't you? Well, I'm not going to because I personally don't find erectile dysfunction very funny. Did you ever consider that maybe Witchy Poo's wand is having trouble performing because it's on antidepressants? Please just text me back, Chloe. I promise it had nothing to do with you. Witchy Poo then flees on the Vroom Broom, and Puff and Stuff asks for help from the four winds to take her down. The West Wind, who's a John Wayne-like cowboy. Howdy, partner. We'll be glad to help you. The South Wind, who's a Southern Belle. Hi, y'all. I'm right here too, sugar. The Northern Wind, who's like an Iceman with a dialect I can't place. <laughs> and the East Wind, who's unfortunately a racist Asian stereotype. Oh, so, East Wind here? Oh, you guys couldn't have just made him from the East Coast and speak in the New York accent? I'm blowing here. <laughs> All four winds then blow together, causing Witchy Poo to fall and crash into her castle. Her and Orson fucking die, everyone dances, and the episode ends. <laughs> Then over the credits of every episode, a band called The Boyds sings to all the Lonely Island residents. You got someone who loves you, you got someone who cares. Episode 2, The Wheelie Bird. This episode begins with Puff and Stuff and Jimmy being called down to the island candy factory by the owner who is made of candy. Because his employees, who are a bunch of hippie ants, are going on strike. We just want to do our own thing. Nothing. We want to do nothing. No, no. If you do nothing, you get nothing. If you want candy, you must work for it. No one gets anything without working for it. Understand? Okay, so I guess Puffin Stuff is a staunch capitalist. 
Also, I think it's worth noting that this aired at like the height of the Vietnam War. So having hippie characters with signs that say things like make candy, not war was weirdly like topical and political for a children's show. It'd be like seeing the characters from Paw Patrol at a pro-choice rally. Anyway, a talking clock shows up with a proclamation from Witchy Poo. <laughs> Hear ye, hear ye! Let it be known to all residents of Living Island that Jimmy and his golden flute are one but a witch, or else. Or else? Or else! <laughs> Jimmy wonders why Witchy Poo hates him so much, but Puffin Stuff whispers to him that it's really Freddy she wants. And if you're thinking that Puffin Stuff's giant puppet head whispering into Jimmy's ear must look really weird, you're right. I'm afraid Freddy is right. The witch wants him. Puffin Stuff says they need to find a way to get Jimmy and Freddy off the island, so they again go to see Dr. Blinky. Man, if Puffin Stuff needs help from Dr. Blinky so often, one can't help but think maybe he should be the mayor. Also makes me wonder who Dr. Blinky goes to for help. Like, how deep does this thing go? As they travel, they're watched by Witchy Poo, who sees Freddy crawl out of Jimmy's pocket toward her castle to turn himself in. I just gotta give myself up to the witch to save Jimmy. I just gotta, I've just gotta. He's entering my forest. I've got him. I've got him. I've got the golden flute. <laughs> then as Puff and Stuff and Jimmy continue through the woods, they sing about their friendship. Okay, this song I actually sang in a video that my friend and I made when we were 11. How lucky I am, how lucky I am to have a friend like you. I hate you. <laughs> Man, this show really captivated me when I was already in middle school. Jesus, it's no wonder I didn't have my first kiss until I was 17. They realize Freddy is missing and turn back to look for him. Meanwhile, Freddy is surrounded by the evil trees from the first episode. Witchy Poo then orders them to grab him and take him to her. Evil trees, the gorgeous leader. We read you. What is your command? I want that poot. Grab him. Oh, no, no, let me go. How is she able to communicate with them all the way from her castle? Are the trees wearing like earpieces that we can't see? Unable to find Freddy, Puff and Stuff and Jimmy seek guidance from Blinky, whose belongings give him an idea. Why don't you use it like they do in Charlie Book? Lexi means my story called the Trojan Horse, age 37. Hey, I remember that story. Oh, the good guy sit in a wooden horse. Wait, so on Living Island, they're familiar with human legends like the Trojan War. What is Living Island's relationship with the human world? Matt Pat needs to drop a video on Puff and Stuff lore like yesterday. I've got to come over and read you some night. Anytime, Mayor. Inspired by the story, the gang decides to sneak into Witchy Poos by piling into Blinky's invention called the Wheelie Bird. And there must be some Doctor Who technology going on here because there's no way Puff and Stuff's giant ass could have squeezed in there. They drive the machine up to the castle when Orson comes out. And even though they wanted the wheelie bird to operate like the Trojan horse from Greek mythology, it ends up being more like Pygmalion and Galatea because Orson, also being a bird, wants to fuck this thing. Hi there, sugar. My, you're a pretty vulture. Ooh, 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 ooh. He leads the wheelie bird inside and they're able to knock him out before splitting up in search of Freddy. Unfortunately, Witchy Poo catches Jimmy, Kling, and Clang, trapping them in a cage. No! Please wait, Miss Witch! How dare you call me by my first name! Puffin Stuff then snatches Witchy Poo's wand, using it to free the others. Then, as Witchy Poo makes one last attempt to flee with Freddy, Puffin Stuff casts a spell that turns her into two smaller witches. <laughs> The two witchy poos then start beating up Orson and Seymour, giving Jimmy the opportunity to grab Freddy and escape with the others. And that's the end of the episode. You know, I take it back. I don't think anybody working on this show was using drugs. Episode 3, Showbiz Witch. This one opens with Witchy Poo again spying on Jimmy, Puff, and Stuff, and Freddy. After realizing they're nearby, she runs out the castle after them. Castle, castle, with face so cute. Will I catch that golden flute? No chance, you old coot. Oh, what do you know? You got crap 
cracks in your plaster. <laughs> That's funny. Castle, cracks in his plaster. <laughs> <laughs> this show is exhausting to watch, man. Meanwhile, Puff and Stuff and Jimmy meet with a lion character named Ludacris. Get back, get back, who's selling lotion. But Puff and Stuff asks him if he knows a way to get Jimmy and Freddy off the island. He says he has a magic pogo stick that could do the job, but it will cost them 200 buttons. That's what we use for money here on Living Island, Jimmy. Sorry, Ludacris, the treasury's empty. Our buttons have hit bottom. Wait, what? Is this whole show taking place during an economic recession on Living Island? Just further proves my theory that Puff and Stuff isn't fit to lead. Ludacris refuses to give them the pogo stick without his money. Too bad, folks. My motto is fly now, pay now. Come back when you've got the buttons. Jimmy then suggests they raise the funds by putting on a talent show and charging for admission. An idea the trees are excited by. Wait till they see my dance. Chicka chicka boom, chicka boom. Man, bless the people in these tree costumes. Doing this was their job. Think about that. Watching all of this, Witchy Poo tells Orson and Seymour that the three of them are going to enter the show in disguise in order to steal Freddy. Witchy Poo then gets in her chair to be made over. Wait a minute! Your highness is too hard! Yep, no drug references here. At the talent show, Jimmy and Freddie perform a number called the Pronoun Song. The subject for today is pronouns. So what you say we have a couple of go-rounds? And for something from 1969 called the Pronoun Song, it's aged surprisingly well. He is a simple word, she is a tender word, they is the mating of a him and her. Witchy Poo, Orson, and Seymour then perform under the guise of a group called the Three Oranges. Oranges, oranges, who said? Oranges, oranges, who said? Oranges, oranges, who said? There ain't no rhyme for oranges. But a stumble towards the end reveals them to everybody. Acting fast, they grab Freddy and run, and... As mayor and chief of police, I order you to stop! Wait, Puffin Stuff is a cop too? That's kind of a conflict of interest. I thought this was the drug show. Witchy Poo escapes with Freddy on her vroom broom back to the castle, where she says what she intends to do with him. Oh, when those other hags see you, they'll eat their hearts out! <laughs> other hags? The annual witches' convention. You and I are going to do a little act together. Witchy Poo and Freddy. Oh, we'll knock them for a loop. Wait, is that the whole reason that Witchy Poo wants Freddy to perform with him at the witches' convention? I thought she'd be able to use Freddy for some, like, ancient, powerful type of magic, but nope. I guess she just thought he'd be a cool thing to own. Puff and Stuff and Jimmy sneak into the castle by stealing the uniforms of the skeleton guards. <laughs> Man, they really just beat the shit out of those guys. Puffin Stuff really is a cop. Jimmy and Puffin Stuff then arrive, but the witch, thinking Jimmy to be one of her guards, starts dancing with him. Well, just don't stand there. Grab a partner. Me. <laughs> Jimmy then takes the opportunity to throw her in the cauldron, take Freddy, and escape. And the episode ends with Witchy Poo's wand once again having performance issues. <laughs> It doesn't work when it's soggy. Up, wand! Up! Wait, what happened to Ludacris' pogo stick that was gonna get Jimmy and Freddy off the island? You can't just not follow up on that. The fact that Jimmy really doesn't seem in any hurry to get off this island is a little concerning because, well, he is a teenage boy, and eventually he's gonna need to help out his other flute, if you catch my drift. And frankly, he doesn't seem to have many options there, at least not ones of his own species. There's literally an episode of Rick and Morty about this exact scenario. Also, I do love this show, but how many episodes are gonna consist of Puff and Stuff and Jimmy breaking into Witchy Poo's castle to save Freddy? Is it like all of them? Episode 4, The Mechanical Boy. So this episode begins with Jimmy sneaking out of Puff and Stuff's house in the middle of the night and Kling and Clang following him. Once they catch up, he asks for their help capturing the witch's boat, the same one from the intro, so him and Freddy can sail back home. You two, come back here! You go by yourself, the witch will surely get you! 
<laughs> At the castle, Orson watches them attempt this and reports it to Witchy Poo. <gasps> they are trying to steal my boat. Those little grabbers. See, I told you so. Yeah, 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 yeah. No more. <laughs> <laughs> you don't love me. No one loves me. I'm a failure, you hear me? A miserable, total failure. Whoa, did this show just pull a Simpsons and predict millennials? All Orson needs is a shirt about adulting and a mug of his Hogwarts house. I feel he's a Ravenclaw. Because he's a bird. Anyway, Witchy Poo catches Jimmy red-handed, but after freezing him with magic and realizing he doesn't have Freddy on him, she figures she can still use having him captured to her advantage. So she turns him into a mechanical boy. Who are you? I'm a mechanical boy. I don't know what that means exactly. I mean, he's clearly under the witch's control. Be happy! Happy! <laughs> Be sad! Be sad. But I don't know about mechanical, he still seems pretty fleshy to me. Weird to specify mechanical if there's not going to be any aesthetic change, especially in a show with so many cool costumes. Witchy Poo orders the mechanical Jimmy to bring her Freddy within the next 24 hours. The next morning at Puffin Stuff, Jimmy grabs Freddy and begins to leave, but Puffin Stuff questions him. Jimmy, what happened to you? Why are you walking that way? Jimmy then sings a song here called Mechanical Boy, which is... Honestly, my favorite song in the whole series. I'm a mechanical boy, like a mechanical toy. Realizing Jimmy is under what is called a time spell, Puffin Stuff takes him to the clock people. It must be a time spell. Jimmy, I'm taking you to the clock people. So after leaving Freddy with Dr. Blinky, they arrive where the clock people agree something is wrong. Oh, the poor boy, he looks so sad. <laughs> sad. <laughs> Their leader, Grandfather Clock, haha, -ha, thinks he can cure Jimmy with his time machine. Unfortunately, Witchy Poo, who's been watching all of this unfold, arrives via Vroom Broom to Dr. Blinky's where Freddy is being held. Also, not to go all cinema sins on this baby show, but why does Witchy Poo ever need to use the Vroom Broom when it's been established that she can teleport? <laughs> Dr. Blinky is nowhere to be found, but she begins tearing apart his house in search of Freddy nonetheless. Jimmy then emerges from the machine, seemingly free of the spell, just as Kling and Clang arrive after escaping from the witch and inform Puff and Stuff that she's at Dr. Blinky's. There, she finally finds Freddy, but on her way out is confronted by Puff and Stuff and the gang. She pulls a wand on Freddy, but Jimmy has the idea to kick some dust towards Dr. Blinky's house, causing it to sneeze, which first knocks Freddy out of Witchy Poo's hands, returning him to Jimmy. Then a second sneeze blows Witchy Poo's dress off, prompting her to run away in humiliation. <laughs> Episode five, Box Kite Caper. This one begins with Ludacris hosting a kite flying competition. When Jimmy and Freddy ask if they can enter, Puff and Stuff gets the idea to use the competition as a cover for building a kite machine that Jimmy and Freddy can use to fly home without Witchy Poo noticing. However, after acquiring materials to build the device, it's revealed that Witchy Poo is watching them. You whistle all right, my fancy flute. But it will be my song you'll be playing. You'd think at this point they'd have caught on to the fact that Witchy Poo can see their every move. Witchy Poo then explains to Orson and Seymour how she plans to sneak into Puff and Stuff's cave disguised as a kindly old woman to destroy the kite machine and steal Freddy. We transition back to Puff and Stuff and the gang building the box kite, just as Kling and Clang slide in and break it, ruining their progress. Luckily, Dr. Blinky then arrives to help. Never fear, Dr. Blinky's here! Of course, because Puff and Stuff can't do shit for himself, always needs the help of that old bird. What happened to your kite? Goodness, it's a mess! We had a little accident. Two little accidents. <laughs> Whoa, Puff and Stuff! Yes, Kling and Clang were the result of an unplanned teen pregnancy that their mother seriously considered terminating but ultimately decided on putting up for adoption. But to call them accidents is just a rude dehumanizing oversimplification. Dr. Blinky repairs the kite with an invention he calls stick it to him glue, which leaves the kite practically indestructible. Now try and pull it apart. Uh, uh. Oh. Meanwhile, the disguised Witchy Poo elaborates on her scheme. This sleepy 
baking powder on this candy will knock them out cold, and then Frabberini, the golden fleece will be mine. Mine. Oh my God. She's gonna roofie them. She manages to enter Puff and Stuff's cave by claiming to be part of a group called the Campfire Grannies. Oh, we're a new group. A bunch of sweet melons. <laughs> we're the Campfire Grannies. We make cookies, we make candies, and our motto is down with fatigue. And convinces the whole gang to try her chocolates, which take effect almost immediately. Gee, Puff and Stuff, I sure feel funny and sleepy. I think I'll take a nap. Oh, my. I feel so tired. My head is so heavy, I must lie down. Does anybody still think that the drug references in the show were unintentional? Because this is exactly how my friends and I sound after we take edibles. Witchy Poo begins tearing the place apart in search of Freddy. Luckily, Kling, whose chocolate was stolen by Clang, is still awake and able to keep Freddy safe. Unable to find him, the witch still has Orson destroy the box kite. Break it! Break it! Wait, literally like three minutes ago, they established that it was indestructible. Why'd they establish that just to retcon it immediately after? Hey, what is this? The Star Wars sequel trilogy? Everyone wakes up to the mess and realizes what happened. Jumpin' Jehazaphat, we've been drugged. That little old lady must have been the witch. He, ju he just said they were drugged. They used the word drugged. They knew. Fortunately, Dr. Blinky assures the kite can be fixed. We then cut to later where with the box kite finished, Jimmy and Freddy say their goodbyes. Come on, Jimmy, get on the kite. Time to go. Hurry before the witch wakes up. Gosh, I don't know what to say. You've been such a good friend to me. This show is so weird, man. Sorry, just seeing that kid try and sincerely say farewell to his felt dragon best friend made me want to reiterate that. As Jimmy and Freddy fly away, Orson informs Witchy Poo of their escape. She begins to attack the box kite from her vroom broom, and Puffin Stuff invokes the West Wind to help Jimmy. We hear ya, partner. We'll huff and we'll puff and we'll blow Jimmy home. Wow, didn't expect him to be a recurring character. Whatever you do, just please don't bring back the East Wind. Blow, West Wind! Blow! Blow! When your girl Wind almost has you finished, but you hear her parents coming home? Even with the Wind's help, Witchy Poo manages to damage the box kite enough that it begins to descend. But despite a bumpy landing, Jimmy and Freddy are fine. The West Wind then turns on the witch, blowing her out of the sky. The Vroom Broom crashes and everybody dances. <laughs> Yo, Seymour looks straight up dead there. Is anybody even inside the costume in that shot? Episode 6, The Golden Key. We begin with Jimmy and Freddy asking Ludacris for a way to get them off the island. Well, what we were looking for, Mr. Lion, is a way for Freddy and me to get home. Without the witch finding out. <laughs> Why was there like a delay there? Also, you guys should know he has a way off the island because he already told you about the pogo stick. He sells them an escape map in this episode, but whatever happened to that pogo stick? I'm really mad about that. Anyway, he sells them this map to a golden key that can open an escape door off the island. Then we transition to the witch's castle. I love you. <laughs> so you should know the drill by now. Witchy Poo finds out about Jimmy and Freddy's escape plan and leaves to put a stop to it. After finding the first two pieces of the key with the trees, they run into Dr. Blinky, who's using his new invention, the sound box. See? This is a button that made the spooky sound you just heard. Listen! Shardy. Blinky gives them the box to help with their search for the rest of the key. Don't really know why that would help, but I guess we'll find out. Then, after Witchy Poo orders the evil tree to grab Jimmy and Freddy as they enter the forest, uh, this happens? I have a very good suggestion, which I make in all humility, my dear Miss Witch. What is that, my sweet? Stop! I honestly don't know what that was. I don't know what he was saying. Orson's never done that before. Back with the good guys, they read that the final piece of the key lies near a mushroom with a cigar. Mushroom. Interesting. Upon finding the smoking fungus, Jimmy pulls his cigar, which causes a robotic hand to pop out holding the last piece of the key. But then the mushroom is like mad about it and calls the witch's trees to grab Jimmy. Ouch! He tweaked my cigar. 
Help, evil trees, help. So if he's mad about his cigar being pulled, it, did he like not agree to being part of this scavenger hunt? If not, then how is his cigar like programmed to activate that mechanical hand? Anyway, Jimmy grabs the last piece of the key and runs away from the evil trees. With the last piece, they're able to fully assemble the key, which begins to act as a compass, pointing them in the direction of the escape door. However, the witch flips the sign to the golden door and transforms the door to her dungeon, tricking the gang into entering. When they arrive, Puff and Stuff is the only one to get trapped inside. So Jimmy, Kling, and Clang play sounds of warfare from the sound box and throw rocks through the castle window to make Witchy Poo think an army is attacking her. Panicked, she sends Puff and Stuff out to negotiate peace terms as mayor. He locks her inside and she has an existential crisis. This is too much! What did I ever do to deserve this? I've tried to be a bad witch. I try to do evil unto others. I practice my spells. Why me? Why is it always me? Episode 7, The Birthday Party. Puff and Stuff notices that Jimmy seems down, and Freddy explains that's because it's his birthday and he's feeling homesick. Hearing this, Puff and Stuff decides to throw him a surprise party. Discovering this, Seymour wakes up Witchy Poo, who forgets to remove her sleeping mask and smashes into the wall. Hey, Jeepy, wait, stop! Ah, why should I have the boss around here? <laughs> Which she blames on Seymour and smacks him. <laughs> you spooky spider! Next time, warn me before I smash my snoot! <laughs> She is a mean, rotten lady, but I kind of like her. That was me as a child having a crush on Azula. She then snatches the phone from Orson to eavesdrop on Puff and Stuff. You're always grabbing things, always grabbing. Fun fact, those were the exact words on the incident report filed against John Lasseter. She realizes the party might provide an opportunity to... Say it with me now. Steal Steal already. Already. Later in the woods, Puff and Stuff asks Jimmy to put on a blindfold. As mayor, I'm afraid I'll have to blindfold you. You too, Freddy. Blindfold? I don't understand why. God, I hope Jimmy gave consent to this roleplay ahead of time. No, it's to surprise Jimmy with a birthday party where all his Living Island friends are in attendance. But Witchy Poo, Orson, and Seymour try infiltrating the party as a band called the Three Lemons. Where the Three Lemons? You mean to say you never heard any of our records? Man, are you from Squaresville? Similar to their episode 3 disguise as the Three Oranges. These are the type of subtle callbacks that only experts in Puff and Stuff lore such as myself will pick up on. She then plays her saxophone, which emits smoke that causes everyone to have a laughing fit upon inhaling it. I'll say that again. Her saxophone emits smoke that causes everyone to have a laughing fit upon inhaling it. <laughs> Anybody still buying that statement from Marty Croft? Anybody? In this state, Jimmy hands Freddy over without hesitation. You won't mind if I take Freddy for a while. You just take him as long as you want, you old hag. <laughs> everyone then crashes, including Orson, who stays to watch over everyone but accidentally knocks himself out. Must have been Indica. Later, Dr. Blinky is the first one awake, and he uses an invention called the Get Em Up Horn to wake everyone else. Get up, everybody! Get up! Get up! No, Dr. Blinky, if you want to get the attention of a bunch of stoned people, you say either the pizza's here, or can anyone explain to me the plot of Donnie Darko? Once awake, everyone realizes that the witch took Freddy. But inspired by the dots, Orson got stuck to his face from falling into a plate of candy. Puff and Stuff sends a clock to inform the witch there's been an outbreak of a virus called Red Spot Itis. Epidemic! Red Spot Itis! Danger! Hear ye! Red Spot Itis! Looks a lot like measles, but it's much worse! Anyone with Red Spot Itis is quarantined by order of May of Puff and Stuff! Epidemic! Epidemic! Red Spot Itis! Alarm! 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 Let's hope this doesn't lead to Living Island celebrities singing a cover of Imagine. Our heroes then all show up to the castle disguised as medics. Make way for the mayor's disaster team! Get him out, he's sick! Puff and Stuff clearly doesn't care about the immunocompromised based on how he's wearing his mask. And they rescue Freddy. The castle itself then begins to worry about the outbreak. We've got to get out of here. Eve. Oh. Eve. Oh. And begins to quake, dropping debris on Witchy Poo and Orson. <laughs> Episode 8 The Horse with the Golden Throat. 
This will probably be a weird one. You know, as opposed to all the previous episodes, which weren't weird. So this one starts with Ludacris's horse, named simply Horsey, accidentally swallowing Freddy, thinking he was a carrot. What's that whistle? <laughs> what whistle? <laughs> what whistle? It came from inside him. It swallowed Freddy. Hello down there. Freddy, are you all right? Puff and Stuff then, of course, suggest they take Horsey to Dr. Blinky. But Horsey, who's afraid of the doctor, runs away. And then Kling and Clang, who weren't present in this scene before, suddenly appear. Which makes me assume that the two performers in the Horsey costume are the same performers as Kling and Clang. Those poor people. Oh, Horsey! How? <laughs> Kinda hope they don't catch him. A whistling horse should make a fortune. I could star him in a musical western. Witchy Poo sees Freddy getting swallowed as an opportunity to steal him, so she orders the trees to kidnap Horsey. Well, well, if it isn't our old friend, the polka dotted horse. Hi, Spotty. Wanna rub your back against me? Whoa, what is this, Secretariat? I haven't seen it. Does she not fuck the horse in that one? The trees try and capture Horsey, but Puff and Stuff and Jimmy show up. Kling and Clang noticeably absent again, and wrestle him away. So they take Horsey to Dr. Blinky, but before he can remove Freddy, the witch shows up to distract him by pretending that Orson has been injured. I must do something right away! <laughs> you poor dear! You must have some terrible disease to look that bad! I'm not the one who's sick, you dope! He is! And Blinky recognizes her as the witch, by the way. Just a minute here! You're the witch! Of course I'm the witch! But still tries to help Orson because that's just the kind of guy that Blinky is. My goodness, he looks worse than you do. He must really be sick. Meanwhile, inside, the fireplace claims that he can get Freddy out. If someone would just listen to me, I know what to do, see? Okay, fireplace, what's your idea? Smoke. Smoke? Smoke? Now, before you accuse this of being another drug reference, what the fireplace actually means is filling up the room with his smoke and hotboxing. They're hotboxing. Dude. When everyone starts coughing, Jimmy opens the window, which Horsey coughs Freddy out of, throwing him into the witch's hands. But then Blinky's house sneezes from all of the smoke, knocking Witchy Pooh's clothes off and Freddy out of her grip. <laughs> Wait, didn't this exact same thing happen in episode 4? I can't believe this, because other than that, this show's plots vary so much episode to episode. After she runs away, Freddy is still nowhere to be seen. Huh? Have you seen him? No, I did. <laughs> you know, the reason Freddy has so little screen time in this episode is because the actor was on paternity leave at the time. Episode 9. The stand-in. Puffin Stuff receives a telegram that his movie star sister, Shirley, is coming to Living Island to film her next project. Puffin Stuff's sister is a movie star! She's coming to Living Island! They're gonna make a movie here! A real movie! We then meet Shirley, who looks like Miss Pac-Man, as well as her German frog producer. Or maybe he's Russian. I don't know. My producer, Akim Chodanov. My little forty friends. Who I feel is supposed to be a parody of a real person, but I can't figure out who. Then Shirley sings a song for everyone. I'd like to do a beautiful dance. In fact, I think I will. Oh, I'm marvelous. Oh, there's no one like me. Uh, that shot makes me feel like Jimmy has been away from the human world for too long and is starting to get desperate. Puff and Stuff has the idea to offer the witch a part in the movie, so that while she's occupied with that, Jimmy can steal the vroom broom from her castle and fly home. While the witch is here, I'll keep her busy. Then you sneak into the castle and grab her vroom broom, and then <laughs> zoom! Home you go! This goes well to start, and Puff and Stuff even uses the opportunity to get some licks in on Witchy Poo. Makeup! Makeup! Coming! Coming! <laughs> But she starts to catch on to their plan and turns to leave before it's too late. Oh, I'm on to you, you lumpy lizard. Out of my way! <laughs> Do you realize you're attacking a woman? I never think of you as a woman. I think of you as a witch. <laughs> That's my occupation. But underneath it all, I'm still a woman. Um, 
based? People are more than their occupation. We stan an anti-capitalist queen. <laughs> anyway, Jimmy enters the castle disguised as the witch and tries to activate the Vroom Broom. But the real witchy poo shows up and they have a magic duel that results in the vehicle bursting into flames. Amidst the chaos, Jimmy escapes the castle with Puff and Stuff and the others. <laughs> Yeah, not much happened in this one. Episode 10, You Can't Have Your Cake. Judy Frog is teaching everyone a dance called the Moonwalk. 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 14 years before, Michael Jackson popularized an entirely different moonwalk. And he was 11 years old when this aired, so it's totally possible he saw it. Ripping off HR Puff and stuff? Man, that's gotta be the worst thing Michael Jackson ever did. After finishing, everyone is exhausted. Ooh, wee, air, give me air. Oh, oh there, there, Paul. I'd better get you home and wind you up, honey. <laughs> Sounds like she's gonna stroke his clock and balls. Later, Kling and Klang discover a giant cake in the woods and bring it home. The others show up just in time for Witchy Poo to pop out of it. Of course the cake belongs to someone. It belongs to me. Steal Freddy and apparate away. <laughs> then, while telling Freddy how she plans to turn him into a pair of earrings, You have enough jewels in your little body to make me a pair of lovely earrings. Earrings? No, no. I thought she wanted to play him at the witch's convention. What? Orson and Seymour inform her they've spotted her cake trap in the woods. She suspects Jimmy and Puff and stuff are inside, so she goes there to confront them when the west wind shows up and puffs a sick cloud that freezes her into a mannequin. Puff and stuff and gang who are conspiring with the wind then show up and take her to their house before leaving to rescue Freddy. Seeing this go down, Orson and Seymour go to rescue her. <laughs> Kling and Klang, who have been left to guard the witch, get cold and go outside to warm up. The southern wind then appears to help them. Hi down there, sugar dumpling. It's little old me, the south wind. Y'all look so cold, I thought I'd cook you up a little old mess of warm air. <laughs> but in doing so, ends up melting Witchy Poo, who escapes as Orson and Seymour arrive. Meanwhile, Puff and Stuff and Jimmy are able to sneak into the castle after Judy Frog distracts the guards with her moonwalk. Moonwalk! <laughs> Judy Frog bopped so Star-Lord could boogie. I'm distracting you, you big turd blossom. Inside, they rescue Freddy, but see on the witch's image machine that she's arriving. So to protect Judy from her, they close the drawbridge. Witchy Poo then tries to jump across, but misses and fucking dies. <laughs> This one was boring too. Episode 11, dinner for two please, Orson. Grandfather Clock informs the gang that he's programmed the time machine to travel to the day before Jimmy arrived on the island in order to send him home. So after saying goodbyes, Jimmy and Freddy get in the machine and Grandfather activates it. We then cut to Witchy Poo, who's grown bored with Orson and Seymour and sings a song about how she can't find a man. And it's a bop. I can't figure out what's the matter with men. My phone hasn't rung since 1910. It's not even a wrong number every now and then. I'm the loveliest witch in town. Her henchmen try to distract her by telling her that Jimmy and Freddy are escaping. And she stops them with her wand, but is too depressed to be excited about it. Great Caesar's ghost witchy poo. That sure was a powerful zap. <laughs> um... Another day, another sad. Even though her sabotage is successful, causing the machine to turn Jimmy and Freddy into old men. What happened? The machine made us old, Jimmy! Who's Jimmy? And who are you?
Have to point out that Freddy has a tiny beard, and I love it. Now senile, Jimmy drops Freddy and wanders off into the woods. There, Witchy Poo sees Jimmy and, not recognizing him, immediately tries to riz him up. Hi, good looking. <laughs> Wish I could say the same. Which I'm gonna say is a little weird given that Jimmy's actor Jack Wilde was underage. Witchy Poo's going from flying her vroom broom to doing a groom groom. What am I saying? She takes him back to the castle and explains all she's willing to do for them to be together. I'll be just a plain housewife, cleaning and cooking and scrubbing and all that fun stuff, and you can be the man of the house. Oh no, Witchy Poo's been radicalized by the TikTok Tradwives. She then pulls a Nathan Fielder and tricks Jimmy into agreeing to marry her. Mm. <laughs> then you'll marry me? Mm. <laughs> they'll get up! Uh... Uh, I do. Oh, 特别好。Nathan, I do. But Puff and Stuff is able to rescue Jimmy before the ceremony and take him back to the time machine to reverse the aging of him and Freddy. Just as they're returned to normal, the witch shows up in search of her groom. There's no prince here. Do be quiet, you little runt. <laughs> you look like... Nah, it couldn't be. The gang then coerces her into the machine, which turns her into a baby. <laughs> I didn't like this one either. Episode 12. Flute, Book, and Candle. For whatever reason, the copy I was able to find of this episode was of a noticeably lower quality than the others. Like, there's a part at the beginning where Freddy is clearly supposed to be talking, but the audio just isn't there. Golly, Freddy sure is enjoying our picnic. Yeah, because I'm blazed as fuck. I assume he'd say something along those lines. After spotting Witchy Poo in the sky, Jimmy takes Freddy and flees into the forest, where he trips and drops the flute near the evil mushrooms, who touch Freddy turning him into a mushroom. Hey, it turned you into a mushroom! Ha ha ha, yeah! Sure, why not? Jimmy then takes the shroomified Freddy to Puff and Stuff, and they actually don't go to Dr. Blinky this time around. Just kidding! Of course they do! What'd you expect? Puff and Stuff, the title character, to overcome an obstacle by himself? Is that what you expected, you idiot? Blinky tries dousing Freddy in anti mushroom powder, but that doesn't work. Hey! Wow. <laughs> Nothing's happened! Freddy's still a mushroom! So, uh, why'd you do it? Why is that a thing in this episode? <laughs> His book, Charlie, then explains he knows how to find an anti-mushroom spell. Not inside my pages, inside my brother's pages. I never knew he had a brother. Oh, yeah. He doesn't talk much about it. He's the black book of the family. Right. Turns out the book's brother is on the witch's side and resides in her castle. So they decide to go there and bring Blinky's Candle, who for some reason asks to go with them. I'll help. What can you do, Candle? I'm a good spy. Get me in the castle. Let me talk to Rotten Book. Fun fact, this candle puppet would later make an appearance on Pawn Stars, where the expert they bring in to look at it annoyingly calls the series H&R Puff and Stuff. The Talking Candle from H&R Puff and Stuff. I mean, they're very unusual to come across items that are H&R Puff and Stuff. Pretty much anybody under the age of 50 doesn't know who H&R Puff and Stuff is. It's H.R. Puff and Stuff, and you call yourself an expert. To sneak into the castle, Jimmy dresses up as a beggar, and it seems like the costume was intentionally designed to resemble that of the artful Dodger from the 1968 version of Oliver, who was played by Jack Wilde, the same actor as Jimmy. Consider yourself at home. Consider yourself one of the family. Look at me, decoding all the Easter eggs in H.R. Puff and Stuff. I'm so glad I don't have a girlfriend or anything, distracting me from providing humanity with such a service. So they're able to successfully get the candle into the palace where he tries to get the information on the spell from Charlie the Book's brother. You calling me Drippy Wick? And you can tell he's the evil brother because he has facial hair. You know, with humans it's actually the opposite. For instance, my clean-shaven brother Justin pays for a subscription to the Daily Wire. 
But the book realizes what the candle is up to and snitches on him to the witch. There's a spy in the castle! There's a spy in the castle! Whoa, whoa! Who's the spy? That's where? But before she can take action, the others show up to save the candle and rip the anti-mushroom spell from the evil book. Dr. Blinky is then able to concoct the potion and turn Freddy back. Freddy! Oh! <laughs> Freddy, it's you! Boy, I sure have a funny mushroom taste in my mouth! <laughs> As Kling and Klang, who got lost in the woods on the way back, show up also turned into mushrooms. <laughs> These are starting to get repetitive, man. Episode 13, A Tooth for a Tooth. This one starts with Witchy Poo going on a rampage, casting spells left and right. The gang takes shelter in Dr. Blinky's house where he reveals he's developed an anti-witch potion. All you have to do is spray it on her. Oh, oh, oh with this. And immediately she'll love everyone! Sounds more like an anti-bitch potion to me! Can we get some of this for my mother-in-law, please? I'm not married. Anyway, it turns out the reason for the witch's tirade is because she has a toothache. I can't stand this toothache! Oh, it's killing me! And honestly, I aspire to one day be so dramatic that a toothache causes me to go on a dark magic murder spree. What an icon. Unable to help her themselves, Orson and Seymour make an appointment with Dr. Blinky to have the witch's tooth pulled without telling him who the appointment is for. Who's the patient? There's no time for that. We're coming right over. Okay. I guess Dr. Blinky takes on medical and dental responsibilities because there are only like four people on Living Island with teeth, so it's not that much of an added workload. Orson and Seymour then decide to disguise her so that Blinky doesn't immediately deny her. How about just a regular little girl? The doctor can't refuse a little girl. Yeah, don't like that line, but hey, at least they probably won't say it again. Oh, goodness me. I can't refuse a little girl. Damn it. Getting her tooth extracted is so painful that Witchy Poo reveals her identity and starts chasing Blinky around. Now I'm going to get you, you fat quack! <laughs> Luckily, the others arrive and are able to spray her with the potion. And it's scenes like this where I'm reminded that I really do love this show. Sprayer! I'm gonna pulverize you! I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm just a bundle of sunshine, waiting to shine down on you. Also, when Blinky said the potion would make her love everyone, he really meant love everyone. There, puffin' stuff, you naughty boy. How come you never visit me at my castle? I can't help but wonder if interspecies attraction is normal on Living Island, or if the potion just made Witchy Poo horny for the nearest living thing. The happy Witchy Poo invites everyone to her castle, and Puffin Stuff suggests Jimmy uses the opportunity to steal her vroom vroom and escape home. The plan goes swimmingly as Jimmy and Freddy fly the vehicle into the skies, but as they do, the potion wears off and the witch, now furious, blasts them out of the sky. They crash into the forest and Witchy Poo orders the evil trees to grab them. But they're saved when the good trees show up. This show's writers must have had some good tree, if you know what I'm saying, bruh. A massive tree fight then ensues, which Puffin Stuff breaks up with a spritz of the potion. <laughs> Love, love everybody! Glad that turned into a tree dance and not a tree orgy. Mostly because I'm worried I'd be into it. I mean, I already kind of have a thing for the talking tree at Rainforest Cafe. Hello, everybody. I'm Tracy Tree. Just something about those big blue eyes, man. Anyway, seeing that Jimmy's escaped, Witchy Poo breaks another tooth on her machine. Oh, I'll tell him a thing or two! Oh, oh! I broke the tooth! I busted my tooth! <laughs> Episode 14, The Visiting Witch. Witchy Poo receives a message from headquarters that Boss Witch is coming to Living Island on an inspection tour. Please, Witchy Poo, calm down. Calm down, he says. The Commander-in-Chief of all Witchdom is coming here for the first time, and he says, calm down! 
That sounds like this is gonna be a lore drop episode, and I personally am here for it. Meanwhile, Puff and Stuff hears about Boss Witch's arrival and gathers everyone using a witch alarm. Witch alarm! Witch alarm! So, like the snapped emerging from the portals in Avengers Endgame, a bunch of past characters show up. Clock Lady, Judy Frog, Ludacris, Horsey. No Dr. Blinky, though. Was the costume at the cleaners that week? Also, there's this weird sped up shot where Puff and Stuff is trying to get everyone in line. Line up, fall in, attention now. Hurry, hurry, <laughs> attention. Why would they randomly speed up a shot like that? <laughs> They send Horsey to go watch the castle for Boss Witch's arrival, but in the forest he finds Stupid Bat crashed and takes from him a message intended for Witchy Poo. He brings it back to the others, who are relieved upon reading it as it says Boss Witch's visit has been cancelled. However, Witchy Poo, who never received the message, is still stressed and wants to give Boss Witch a gift upon her arrival. Oh, I wish I had a little gift for her. Something to put her in a good mood. After seeing Puff and Stuff with the trees on her image machine, she has an idea and teleports to them. Yipes! It's the evil fuzz! Run for it, baby! Oh, the hippie tree wants to run from the fuzz. I wonder why. Something tells me it's not because he's been evading his taxes. The witch then freezes Puff and Stuff to give him as a gift to Boss Witch. But after realizing he's too heavy to carry to the castle, she shrinks him as well. Evil spirits from the land! Make Puff and Stuff sit in the palm of my hand! <laughs> Damn it, that plushie's so much better than the one I have. I also have this flag, a sticker, a cling pop figure, and no sex life. She then takes Puff and Stuff to her dungeon and returns him to his original size. The alarm clock then informs the others of his capture, and Dr. Blinky is suddenly there. Good thinking, but how? I should have known better than to think they'd be able to get through one episode without his help. Realizing Witchy Poo still thinks that the Boss Witch is coming, Jimmy has the idea to show up to the castle disguised as Boss Witch to rescue Puff. The oh. Oh, hey, Jimmy! Once there, the two of them take the opportunity to mess with her. Say, Mel, if I appointed you the new witch around here, how would you handle things? Oh, I could be mean as the dickens. <laughs> yeah, whatever that was, uh, the actor putting his hand in Puffin Stuff's lower jaw to pull it back and growl, I didn't like it, and I hope I never see it again. <laughs> Anyway, Jimmy's costume comes off, revealing their plan, so they flee. Witchy Poo tries to cast a spell on their way out, but her wand was broken earlier, so it explodes. Why is it always me? <laughs> so we never even got to meet the real boss witch. I was promised lore, and it was not delivered. Episode 15, The Almost Election of Witchy Poo. The alarm clock goes around alerting everyone about the upcoming mayoral election, and the good trees explain that nobody ever runs against Puff and Stuff. Ah, old Indian saying, he who run for mayor must be crazy in head. Who said that, baby? The mayor of my tribe, Chief Crazy Head. <laughs> God, I feel like I should donate to an indigenous people's charity just for watching that. And it doesn't get better when Witchy Poo has the idea to run for mayor and goes to the trees to campaign. What do you do for engine? Every night, squaw dance. How? Oh. If you don't know how, you'll get free lessons. Yeah, making that donation right now. Anyway, she actually manages to secure the vote of the good trees. Meanwhile, while the gang is hard at work on Puff and Stuff's campaign, Judy shows up to tell them that Witchy Poo is also running, and is actually securing some people's votes, which distresses Puff and Stuff. Please, friends, I'm still the mayor, and there's only one thing to do in a spot like this. What's that? Don't panic! <laughs> Later, Witchy Poo crashes a Q&A Puff and Stuff is having, and seems to win over even more people. If you're elected, what do you intend to do for the little man? Get him a little woman! <laughs> but Jimmy is able to win everyone back with a campaign song. Behind this man there lies a tale, as everybody knows, of honesty, integrity, and 
much skill at fighting foes. The witch, now desperate, creates in her cauldron what she calls love bombs, which she drops on Puffin Stuff's supporters, causing them to suddenly adore her. Man, dig that crazy smoke! Oh, what an adorable smell! It's from that nice witch! Oh, what a dear sweet lady! Jimmy even sings a new version of the song about her, during which Witchy Poo gets a little too handsy with him for my liking. A super duper swimming pool for every house in town. Puff and Stuff then arrives and feels betrayed to find everyone has now turned on him. So he goes to ask Ludacris for help. Just kidding, he of course goes to apparently the only competent being on the whole of Living Island, Dr. Blinky. So while everyone's partying with the witch, Blinky throws a reverso bomb at them, causing everything to go backwards Tenet style. And suddenly everyone likes Puff and Stuff again. Let's hear it for our old and new mayor, H.R. Puff and Stuff! Also, Kling and Clang pick up the Reverso Bomb and continue to go backwards while everyone laughs. <laughs> but let's see how hard they're laughing when Kling and Clang inevitably shrivel up into fetuses. Episode 16, What Do You Mean The Horse Gets The Girl? Now this is the penultimate episode of the whole series, so if it doesn't end with some dramatic all is lost moment leading into the finale, I'm going to be very disappointed. Like maybe the witch kills Blinky. I don't know how they'd get on without him. So Horsey is fawning over Puff and Stuff's sister, Shirley. Oh, speak to me, my beautiful one. Speak to me. Wow. If I had a nickel for every time a piece of children's media featured an equine character wanting to fuck a dragon, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? But Ludacris comes by and reprimands him for slacking off. How about acting like a horse and doing some work around here? <laughs> work? There's more to life than just working. Based. Comrade Horsey over here. Puff and Stuff and Jimmy then come by to buy a fake mustache from Ludacris for use in a Western film they're currently shooting. They also mention they're in need of another actor, which excites Horsey, but Ludacris steals the opportunity from him. We then cut to the production itself and find Shirley and the frog director from episode 9 are back. They film a scene where Jimmy is like dubbed over with a deeper voice for some reason. How come no sheriff can hold you? Cause when I grease my boots, I grease the rest of me too. <laughs> Ludacris then enters as the sheriff and messes up by arresting the wrong person, which pisses off the director so much that he threatens quitting. Then Horsey shows up, causing an angry Ludacris to hit him. I told you to wait at the wagon to get back to work. He then begins to recite the testimonies from ex-employees of The Ellen Show. Why are you always picking on me? All I ever do is work, work, work. Why? Oh, why, why did I ever leave Wyoming? Upon seeing Horsey, the director has an idea for a new movie starring him titled The Horse Gets the Girl! But he reckons if Horsey's gonna be a star, he needs a new name. What kind of a name is that for a movie star, Horse? From now on, your name will be Pierpont Pony! Hey, at least changing his name was his only demand. He could have asked Horsey for sexual favors like most star-making directors. So they begin the production of the new film with Horsey as the star, where he starts making demands of Ludacris, giving him a taste of his own medicine. You lion, bring him the water, you're holding up production. Okay, okay, I'll do it for the fun. When I get that nag home, mm, oh. Man, Ludacris is just straight up physically abusive. His name may be ludicrous, but the rapper he has the most in common with is Chris Brown. Meanwhile, Witchy Poo, who sees there's a director on the island, thinks he would be perfect to helm an autobiographical screenplay she wrote. You could call it Gone with the Witch! Will you shut up, you <laughs> That's not the most... Gone with the Witch! That's it! So she teleports the director and camera equipment into her castle and forces him to record her. But he's unimpressed by her performance. Who threw me out into the underworld? <laughs> Got a wand to witch with. 
Oh, terrible. I think I will kill myself. <laughs> Man, it's crazy how what's acceptable to say in a children's show has changed over the decades. Like, uh, I don't think they're saying that on Bluey. Figuring the witch was behind the director's disappearance, Puff and Stuff, Jimmy, and Horsey all show up to rescue him. Witchy Poo threatens to zap them, but Horsey eats her wand and then uses it on her from inside his stomach. <laughs> he then becomes mad with power, zapping everything in sight, and the episode ends. Oh my goodness! Oh, Episode 17, Jimmy Who? So we've arrived at the series finale of HR Puffin Stuff. Will we finally get some lore? Will Jimmy and Freddy escape from the island? Will Walt rescue Jesse from captivity? Has the mother been dead this whole time? Only one way to find out. Jimmy is walking in the woods when Witchy Poo blasts him from the sky, causing him to fall and hit his head. He's then found by Horsey, who discovers Jimmy has amnesia. Hi, who are you? Huh? I'm your friend Horse. Don't you remember me, Jimmy? No. Who's Jimmy? Puff and Stuff Kling and Clang then show up. And I'm just realizing Horsey, Kling, and Clang are on screen at the same time in this episode, so I guess they weren't the same performers. Or maybe they were in that previous episode and weren't in this one. It doesn't matter. But since this is the last episode, they're gonna play all the hits. So upon finding Jimmy has no recollection of anyone, they take him to Dr. Blinky. Huh? Who? I'm the owl. I'm supposed to say who, not you. Blinky says he has a spray that can restore Jimmy's memory, and as he spritzes him, he encourages Puff and Stuff to try reminding Jimmy of a positive memory. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and think. Think. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, is this a clip show episode? Uh, you mean the one where the characters were talking about crazy things that happened in previous episodes? And then they flash back to the scenes they were talking about? Yes, we're all sitting on that couch right there. I, more than anybody, don't need to be reminded of memorable moments from previous episodes. That's what I've been doing for the past this long. God, now I know how my parents feel, because I'm disappointed. It doesn't work, so they give him another spritz while reminding him of the time he was disguised as a beggar. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. You're a beggar. A beggar. Whoa, puff and stuff. I don't think you can say that. <laughs> was that edit crossing a line? It might have been. If it was, I promise, I will make an apology video. I just need to learn how to play the ukulele first. When that doesn't work either, everyone leaves the room to discuss further action. And the unsupervised Jimmy decides to get up and leave. In the forest, he's captured by the evil trees who take him to Witchy Poo who upon discovering his memory is gone, tries reminding him of becoming the mechanical boy. Evil spirits, mean and tyrannical. Make Jimmy remember when he was mechanical. <laughs> And this flashback I'm actually okay with because it means I get to hear that awesome song again. That's because I'm a, cause I'm a, cause I'm a, cause I'm a, cause I'm a mechanical boy. Puff and Stuff Kling and Clang then show up to rescue Jimmy. And after a scuffle, Witchy Poo's wand ends up in the hands of the amnesiac Jimmy, who is convinced by her to use it on Puff and Stuff. That's right, Jimmy! Zap him! Say bees knees! I order you to freeze! <laughs> no, Jimmy, don't! But Kling and Clang redirect the blast to the ceiling, causing debris to rain down, knock Jimmy on the head, and restore his memory. Puff and Stuff, what are we doing in a witch's castle? Jimmy, you're all right. That bump on the head brought your memory back. Quick, let's get out of here. Our heroes then flee before Orson picks up the wand and uses it on Witchy Poo, causing her to hit her head and get amnesia. Don't you remember? It's me, Orson. What's an Orson? <laughs> Then after the credits, like he has in every previous episode, Jimmy says... See you next week! But we didn't see them next week, because that was the last episode. That's right, not only was Witchy Poo never definitively taken down, not only did Jimmy and Freddy never get off the island, we didn't even get to see Horsey and Shirley have horse-dragon hybrid babies. But lucky for us, that was not the Living Isle end of the story. Because in 1970, a year after the finale first aired, a feature-length film based on the series titled simply Puffin' Stuff 
was released in theaters. Everybody, but everybody is coming to see Puffin Stuff. Universal Pictures brings you the biggest musical fantasy since The Wizard of Oz. Now, I was expecting this to act as a wrap-up of the original show's continuity in the vein of series finale movies like Serenity or Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh. But in typical Puff and Stuff fashion, the reality is much weirder than that. This movie is actually a continuity reboot of the series, as we see the events of the intro, as well as some of the first episode, reimagined before the plot goes in a different direction. Most of the actors return, although some of the looks and voices of the characters are changed slightly, like Puff and Stuff now wears a cowboy hat for some reason. So watching this movie won't actually provide us with any definitive answers as to the fate of these characters in the original show timeline. But maybe we can assume that similar to Spider-Verse, there are certain canon events that happen to every version of these characters across dimensions. Or maybe, maybe, I shouldn't have made this video. But before we dive into the movie, I thought that it might be fun in the spirit of speculating whether drugs were involved in Puff and Stuff's development or not, if I first took this completely normal, monetization-friendly piece of gummy candy. All right, now let's wait about an hour. HR Puffin Stuff, who's your friend when things get bad? Why did I think this would be a good idea? I'm not going to be able to record the rest of this right now. All right, here we go. Puffin Stuff the movie, 1970. So the film opens with Witchy Poo speaking directly to the audience. Stop eating your popcorn and be quiet! That's better. But Witchy Poo, I'm watching this at home and the only thing I have to munch on are Scoob 2020 branded fruit snacks. I saw an advanced screening of this movie the day Kobe Bryant died. We then cut to the real world where Jimmy sings a song titled If I Could, the lyrics of which I can only describe as the ramblings of a high person. If I could, I would be a giraffe with my head above the trees. So at big parades, I could see. Yo, if I could, I would be a giraffe with my head above the trees, so at big parades, I could see. I wonder if it's possible for me to ever fall in love. Jimmy then realizes he's late for band practice, and when he arrives, another boy trips him, causing him to damage some equipment. You little bully, you! I'm expelling you from the band. No, please don't drop me from the band, Miss Flick. My parents will really be upset. It's no wonder you were kicked out of jolly old England. I wasn't kicked out. My dad was transferred over here by his business firm. I know I'm supposed to feel bad for Jimmy here, but I will always be in support of bullying somebody for being British. I imagine actually talking like this, bruv. Grow up. Everybody say hi to the only people of color in the whole movie! In the woods, Jimmy angrily throws his flute, which causes it to come to life. Hi, Jimmy! You can talk! Characters in movies always have the most understated reactions to witnessing the supernatural for the first time. Like, I feel Ted from 2012 is the only one where anyone reacts realistically. Merry Christmas, everybody! <laughs> Jesus H. Fuck! The flute introduces himself as Freddy, and Jimmy frolics around with him, singing about their friendship. Loneliness has just one cure. The friend I found in you. I'm like baked as all get out, <laughs> and I don't think I'm high enough for this. The movie then adapts the events of the show's intro, where Jimmy and Freddy meet a friendly boat and board it. Whee! Isn't this fun, Jimmy? It beats the knickers off band practice. I'm sorry, beats the what off of band practice? It beats the knickers off band practice. Oh, like pants. Jimmy, next time, maybe just say pants. 
So just like in the show, Witchy Poo appears and takes control of the boat, causing Jimmy to jump ship and swim to the shore of Living Island, where he's found by Puff and Stuff Kling, and Klang's there too. And his reaction to seeing them is even more reserved than when Freddy came to life. Where am I? You're on Living Island, son. And I'm the mayor, H.R. Puff and Stuff. And these two little fellas are Klang and Klang. Pleased to meet you. And I'd like to thank you for saving us. I guess when your days consisted of a talking flute, a talking boat, and a witch, a dragon's not really gonna phase you. The witch then starts blasting them from the sky, but Kling and Clang fire back with ping pong balls. Ping pong balls? They gotta be kidding! <laughs> Luckily, the Vroom Broom runs out of gas, forcing Witchy Poo to turn back toward the castle. Puff and Stuff then introduces Jimmy to all all the characters from the show with a song titled Living Island. And for whatever reason, in the movie, Puff and Stuff's singing voice is completely different from his speaking voice. Living Island is our most amazing place. I still quite like this song though. We're alive and well and living here on <laughs> We then cut to Witchy Poo's castle, which is a much bigger set than in the show. And after seeing Jimmy enter Puff and Stuff's cave on the image machine, she disguises herself as a hippie dance teacher and teleports there to steal Freddy. Oh, oh my! Oh. Come on, Twinkle Toes! Light my oh. fires! <laughs> I can't believe this came out in theaters. Imagine watching this in a theater. Anyway, she grabs Freddy and leaves, and as Jimmy and Puff and Stuff chase after her, she reveals herself and escapes on the Vroom Broom. Jimmy tells Puff and Stuff they need to go rescue him, and I'll give you one guess as to what Puff and Stuff suggests they do. We need all the help we can get. We better go see Dr. Blinky. Dr. Blinky? At Dr. Blinky's, the smoking fireplace gives Jimmy an idea. Hang on a minute. What is it? Well, we want to get into the castle, right? Right. right. Well, what if the witch thought her castle was on fire? That's weird. Usually ideas brought on by some form of smoking are more along the lines of, Yo, I feel Cool Whip, Wheat Thins, and Cholula would low-key be kind of bomb. <laughs> I'm so stoned. Back at the castle, Witchy Poo is on the phone bragging about <laughs> bragging about acquiring the flute to her friend, Witch Hazel. Hi, Haze. Hi, Poo. What's new? Are you sitting down? You know it, baby. Who was played by Cass Elliot, a popular singer at the time. And I think they were just so glad to have like a popular name in the movie that they forgot to give her character any personality, especially compared to Witchy Poo. He was giving her warts! <laughs> anyway, this gopher character burrows into the castle and begins unleashing bagged smoke, allowing the others to storm inside dressed as firefighters and secure Freddy before leaving, leaving Witchy Poo to question everything. Oh, why didn't I listen to Mother? <laughs> and Mary a nice, reliable werewolf. <laughs> Twilight joke. Then back in Town Square, they celebrate with another banger of a song. You're a dear little dragon. You're a personal bell. When the spirits are sagging, whose tail is wagging? Friendly. The postman Pelican then shows up, and him combined with the gopher who wears a miner's hat made me realize Puff and Stuff has basically the same premise as Animal Crossing. A human living on an island full of talking animals. Just swap out the capitalist raccoon mayor for a capitalist dragon. Blinky has the idea for the Pelican to smuggle Jimmy and Freddy off the island by carrying them in his throat pouch. Oh my. Hey, that's my lunch! Sorry. Yeah, let's watch it in there! But he's unable to take off with the added weight, and they crash. So what was the point of the scene? I personally would never include something so unnecessary just to extend my project's runtime.
Distraught over losing the flute, Witchy Poo gets a call on her phone, which is kept in a furnace for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> From Boss Witch, who informs her the witch's convention will now be held at her castle, so everyone can see the flute she recently obtained. Panicked, Witchy Poo vows to steal Freddy back, so she flies to the main village. Anyway, I started blasting. Bam! Wow. Oh. But Puffin Stuff calls on a now flesh toned West Wind for help. Ah, West Wind! Howdy, partner! Who blows Witchy Poo out of the sky, sending her crashing into the castle. In the aftermath of the attack, everyone gathers into Puffin Stuff's cave to regroup. Except for Jimmy and Freddy, who leave to find a way off the island themselves, not wanting to endanger their new friends any further. It's then revealed that Witchy Poo is outside Puffin Stuff's cave, disguised as a sunflower. <laughs> <laughs> what am I watching? What? <laughs> what? Get lost, Buster! <laughs> Everyone comes out to look for Jimmy, when Witchy Poo shrinks them down and takes them back to her castle for interrogation. And the effects of them being tiny are actually pretty impressive and creative for the time. When they tell her they don't know, she restores their size and sends them to the dungeon. Then she orders Stupid Bat to search the island for Jimmy. And when she whispers into his ear, it looks like she's biting into a corn on the cob. I've got a secret mission for you, so listen closely, because... I don't want any boo-boos! I'm baked. Stupid Bat delivers a message to Jimmy that the others are captured, and will only be spared if he surrenders himself to Freddy and the witch. He then reports back to Witchy Poo, who's deciding what to cook for the witch's banquet. <laughs> this looks yummy! <laughs> bat wings or gratin? Please don't eat a bat. Bad things are known to happen when people do that. She ultimately decides to cook the captured puffin stuff. <laughs> yes, sir! Now your finger licking good! Spin for the colonel! <laughs> All the witches then show up for the convention, including finally the real boss witch, who has a rat henchman that is a Nazi. And what I mean by that is he's a Nazi! Achtung! Make way for her abominable majesty! Queen of all evil, Boswick! Quick, somebody show him 21 Jump Street. Jonah Hill's performance will make him like Jewish people again. Go into incredibly descriptive details of the story so we all know. Jimmy then shows up disguised as a witch to rescue the others. And when he sees Puff and Stuff tied to the spigot, there's this really weird edit. <laughs> What was that? The witches, led by Witch Hazel, then all sing a song, which I am so grateful to be watching while stoned. Wonder no longer, together we're stronger. It's not so bad to be different. Witchy Poo then notices Freddy in Jimmy's pocket and attacks him. <gasps> She's wearing a wig! I thought she had brown roots. She takes Freddy and throws Jimmy in the dungeon with the others. But the gopher shows up to save them. Oh man, I'm having like deep thoughts right now. After escaping through a tunnel to Dr. Blinky's house, they read inside Charlie the book that witches are terrified by angels. So they get to work, making angel disguises for everyone. I'd volunteer to be an angel too, but I know I'd flunk the physical. Meanwhile, the witches sing another song that's not as memorable. Together we can dance. Everyone shows up dressed as angels, causing the witches to evacuate. Amidst the chaos, Jimmy's able to snatch Freddy and free Puff and Stuff before escaping. In a final act of desperation, Witchy Poo follows them to the village and attempts to bomb them, but ends up blowing herself up. <laughs> she doesn't die, though. What is it about you rotten good guys? You always win! <laughs> Then everyone celebrates the victory with a reprise of Living Island over the credits. So I did it. I watched all 17 episodes 
and the movie of H.R. Puffin Stuff. In the years since, Puffin Stuff has made cameos in shows like Chips and George Lopez. In 2005, animator Todd Kaufman apparently tried to reboot Puffin Stuff as an animated series, which there even exists some animatics and concept art for, but that never came to fruition. And then in 2016, Puffin Stuff along with Kling and Clang made an appearance on the Sid and Marty Croft Nick Jr. show Mutton Stuff where he's revealed to be the uncle of that show's main character named Simply Stuff. How a dragon is an uncle to a dog? I have no idea. If they ever did bring the franchise back, I think doing so as an animated series would be a good idea, but maybe a more adult one that leaned into the drug references. And if you do, please let me write it. I have a degree in screenwriting that I'm worried I'm never gonna get to use. But yeah, that is every existing piece of media featuring H.R. Puffin stuff. Having seen everything, my final opinion is that even though the plots started to get repetitive towards the end of the series, I still love this show for having a one-of-a-kind aesthetic, impressive costumes and props, plenty of catchy songs, and some genuinely funny, absurd moments. As for the theory that drugs were involved in its development, we'll never know for sure, but it will forever remain a great thing to watch whenever you're puffin... stuff. Okay, I'm really craving some Doritos dipped in Nutella, so I'm gonna go. But real quick, just because puffin stuff is on my flag, doesn't mean that these are all characters I intend on making videos about. These are just like a bunch of random niche characters that I like and Spider-Man. Well, I'm just realizing Puffin Stuff's mouth here kind of looks like a puss.